Thank you. There are not many moments in life, in the life of an athlete, when you feel more alive than right before the start of an Olympic race. The crowds are gathered, you stand inside a podium, and everything you did, everything you worked for, or you trained for all those years, have to come together at that one defining moment. Everything you want is control about the outcome, because you didn't work so hard and not win a medal. Everything you want to do is aimed at that one feat. I stood on that starting line of the Olympics in 2010 in Vancouver, in Canada. 1,500 meters speed skating. And it was the first 1,500 meters I raced at the Olympic, at the age of 29. Up to then, I was considered as a skater who tried real hard, was a top athlete, but also failed a lot. I went on my ass a lot. <laughs> I was injured a lot. I was a big talent when I was 20 years old, but I want to share with you not only the stories of the gold medal I won, but the stories about missing out on the Olympics like I did in 2002 and 2006. If you stand on the starting line, and I stood there in Vancouver, it's scary. You have 10,000 people or more in the stands, millions or even billions of people watching through cameras at you. Everything has to come together on that moment. And that's how sport is. And I want to show you what elite sport is, and I'm showing you, I'm not showing it to you, I'm letting you hear what it is. This is the pinnacle of sports. Winning or losing, being remembered as a hero or not being remembered at all, lie within the blink of an eye or within the beep, beeps of a second. The first beep you heard was me winning gold in Vancouver in 2010. The last beep was number 11th. Let me come again. Remember? These are the beeps. This is the difference between winning or losing. This is pro sports. This is black and white. Life at the edges. No gray middle ground. And that's frightening as an athlete because what control do you have over this? If you stand there, everything has to come together, like I said. Well, I failed a lot. And by failure, in the whole road you get there, it took me 12 years to get there on that podium. So you have to deal with fear, with uncertainty. And fear is a strange thing for us humans, because as a human being, we want to feel safe, secure. We are brainwired like that. It's a basic human need, like having a shelter above your head or having food on the table to eat. We rather stay where we are, that feels safe and secure, the absence of fear. But if we want to move forward, and you're ambitious people, right? You want to move forward and live and learn in life, you have to get out there and try and fail. But you have to accept what's come, what, what is coming with that. And I want to share you the story how uh, I did this and what happened to me. At first, missing the 2002 Olympic Winter Games. Well, I was a talented speed skater when I was 20 years old. Uh, and I knew I had talent, but I knew talent alone wouldn't do it. Hard work comes with it. And I was prepared to work hard to reach my goal, being a gold medal in the Olympics in 2002 in Salt Lake City. Well, I trained harder and harder, and I went up and up and better and better. I even reached the pinnacle. I was competing against the best athletes in the world when I was 20, 21 years old. But I thought, this is not enough. I have to do more. I want to control the outcome more. So I trained harder, and I skipped rest days. I even trained harder and harder, and I was losing the feeling of my body. I was lost, and I got lost, and didn't make sensible decisions anymore. My mother, who was a nurse, was the first one to notice the signs of overtraining syndrome. My rest heart rate went up. I started to get anxious. I started to get agitated. I, get, I was getting skinnier. I lost the control. 
My mom warned me for this, but if you're a young man, 20 years old, the last person you're going to listen to is your mom probably, huh? I don't know if there are moms here, but the last person you listen to is your mom. So I was going on like this, and it killed me. I killed myself. I didn't skate the Olympics in 2002. I was lying on the couch and in my bed for four months during that winter. I had a virus infection. No Olympic Games. When I recovered in the spring, the first run I did, I got passed by old ladies. I was not in good shape. I was not in good health. We do stupid things that we think we can control by using more force. There's famous research from the 60s and 70s which proves this. It's about rolling the dice. I don't know if you play board games or you all sit at your computer at night, but if you do play board games or as a child played, played board games, there's famous research about this. It's, it's, it's kind of funny because you maybe remember it. If there's a game and you want to win and you have to throw sixes to win rolling the dice, what do you do? Shake. And you throw hard, right? You throw fast, harder, faster. As if by using more force, you can improve your chance of throwing sixes. <laughs> yes? We do stupid things, we humans, thinking we can improve our chances, we can improve our luck. And like overtraining syndrome, for me, it was stupid. I got lost. I could check every box training what I've done wrong. I could check every box of overtraining. I did it. And overtraining syndrome, the modern or human, normal human, not athletes, <coughs> equivalent, is a burnout. One out of seven people here in this room or in Holland suffer from burnout symptoms. One out of seven, one out of seven people here or the people you work with or hire. Yeah? So that makes you wonder, how self-aware are we, actually? How self-aware are we? Well, we're not that self-aware by research, but also by the things we go through. When I wanted to train for the 2006 Olympics, I fell in another trap. Let me share you a story. Because you don't have your life under control and things happen to you, be it personal or on a work level. For me, I got better and at 23, I was aiming for the top. I was a European champion all round in a new world record points. Headlines in the papers were screaming, why Mark Tuitut is going to win everything the coming years? Why he is the next big superstar in speed skating? Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> no. Alas. The Olympics in 2006, I missed. I didn't qualify. I fell, almost fell, and I was a second behind the first place. Well, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, you know what happens? A second behind the first place, remember the beeps? You're not on the podium. I don't even go to the Olympics. That's what happened. So if you're not there, I was not there and I was thinking, how did this happen? Because I lost a lot of coordination during those races. Physically, I was in the best shape of my life, but coordination, I lost my coordination. How could this happen? I was trained well, <coughs> and it had nothing to do with speed skating. It had everything to do with my personal situation. It had everything to do with the people who were probably closest to me in life by that point. My mom and my dad. And they were in a big fight. For six years long, they were in a divorce. And they were fighting each other through lawyers, through screaming at each other. And I was in between there. As the oldest son, I thought, I can control this. I have to jump in and get these people to reason with each other because they have to find an outcome somewhere. Well, it cost me a lot of energy. Not only seeing the people I loved hurt, but also me costing a lot of energy in this process. And I need that to perform or else I'm a half a second slower and I don't stand on the podium. So I went to my friend Frank. My friend Frank helped me and I said, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this situation? He said, well, Mark, what's your place in this, in this whole spectrum? I said, well, let me think about it. I think, right, 
Well, right here. This is me <clears throat> with my mother in con good contact, supportive of her. I didn't have contact with my dad for five or six years. And still in the fight, trying to influence that situation. He said, well, that's not your place. You're a kid. And for me, this felt perfectly normal. And I knew something was missing. I knew I couldn't control this, but how do I work with this? This felt normal. He said, well, what if we take you out of the equation and we put you back here, Mark? Far away from your mom and your dad and the fight they have with each other. And this is you now in contact with your mom and your dad. And I looked at the picture and I thought, oh, yeah, I want to be there. That feels much better. So I asked Frank, how do I get there? I know how to skate fast, but this is just a picture. It feels better. But how do I reach this in real life? He says, it's not that hard. Just go to your dad. And I did. I went to my dad and said, Dad, after five or six years, six years, I want to get back into contact with you. Just be a dad. Somebody you can fix your car with, redecorate your garden with, or somebody you can go for advice or business advice. My, mom's, my dad's been an entrepreneur all his life. Nothing more, nothing less. And to my mom, I went, I said, Mom, I'm not your mediator. I'm not your help in this. I'm your son. I want to come home at the dinner table and just drink a glass of water or some tea with you. And I feel the love and just have a place to come home to. And I thought this was really hard to do, but actually it wasn't. <clears throat> and it helped a lot. By choosing to do this, the whole situation changed. I felt a relief fall off my shoulders and I could put all the energy I had into speed skating. And it got better. I qualified for the 2010 Olympic Games. Three weeks right before the start of the Games, I trained harder than I ever did. I felt terrible, but I knew this was the plan. Three weeks of rest during up, leading up to the Games, I had for myself. And I knew that I did everything I could to get here. And that's the mindset you can control. I knew that if I was to stand on that starting line, I would sink my teeth into that race and I would never, ever let go. I could encounter bad luck, yes. Somebody could skate faster, yes. But I had to learn that I had to accept every outcome that might follow. It sort of was out of my hands. And I learned a big lesson that the opposite of control is not chaos, but acceptance. And if you think that an athlete stepping on stage or a soldier before a battle or an artist or a musician before they step on stage think they feel joy, no, your brain is screaming at you. I don't want to be here. Please let this be over. It's frightening. But that fear makes you aware. You become aware. And you cannot ignore it. Like a divorce, like your parents, you cannot ignore it. You cannot fool your brain by not thinking of something. Your brain doesn't work that way. The only way that works is to accept that it's there. You accept your fears and you know you need them. So when you step onto the stage, you accept the fears, you accept that the opposite of control is not chaos, but acceptance. You grow and you can use it. And you get stronger. So I challenge you to challenge yourself. Uncertainty is the rule in life, not certainty. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And the only mindset you can adopt is to try every day. Keep on learning. Keep going out there. Keep trying. Keep failing. Keep standing up. Never let go. Accept whatever the outcome might be. And remember, focus on what you can control and let go of what you can't. Thank you. Thank you.